Welcome to Purdue University College of Science Superheroes of Science podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to the science classroom and interviewing scientists. Because as we know, scientists are the superheroes behind the science. So join us as we learn about the scientists and explore current trends in K-12 science education. Welcome to a special edition of Superheroes of Science. We are here in beautiful Berkeley, California with Dr. Tony Murphy, Director of the Globe Implementation Office. Welcome, Tony. Thank you, Sarah. This and is a much neater environment than the office we normally do these in. Yes. <laughs> and a little more noisy, maybe? Yeah, a little bit. A little background noise with the, is it a boat or a ship? I don't know what uh, it is. I think it's like a visitor boat or something. Something that floats. Yeah. Yeah. Something. Up. It's called the Heron. <laughs> oh. Yes. Someone has a better view than that. I can't see it. Well, I can see the beautiful mountains behind you. <laughs> Sorry, I took the, the seat there, didn't I? <laughs> All right, so you're the director of, I, I've always called you director of the GLOBE program, but I, is, is that still a fair statement? or is uh, it? No, it's the GLOBE Implementation Office, okay. which is the main organization that with our um, computer partners, SSAI, we implement the program around the world. So the program office is now based at NASA headquarters because we are funded by NASA primarily. Uh, so let's back up just a hair mm -hmm. and we're throwing out this globe thing. Mm -hmm. And so could you explain exactly what globe, globe is? is? So globe itself is an acronym for global learning and observations to benefit the environment. And it's a K-12 and citizen science program that really connects students, teachers, citizen scientists, and professional STEM professionals or scientists together in uh, the measurement and understanding of our global environment, starting at a local, starting in the local area and really broadening that through the use of technology and databases to a more global understanding. And it's in how many countries now? Right now it's in 122 countries. We just had the country of Georgia sign up uh, last week, and we're looking forward to another country joining very shortly. 122 countries. So do you know, like, the person in each country coordinator? Uh, I know a lot of them, yes. Because I that's, know. that's a lot of people to it, keep track of. It is a lot of people to keep track of. And then we have the U.S. partners, and I know quite a few of those, too. You, Stephen, and Sarah, and uh, so yeah. So there's a lot of people. It's a very much a people relationship organization that really works on bringing people together to really help us as a community understand the environment, but also get kids excited about being part of that environment and looking after that environment, understanding that environment taking measurements that help scientists to understand the same thing and also hopefully for us to safeguard and improve the environment. I'm fairly new in my position and prior to coming to Purdue University I was a high school chemistry teacher and so when I came to Purdue that's when I first learned about the GLOBE program but as a chemistry teacher I was pretty focused mm -hmm. on my curriculum and oh I'm teaching chemistry and this is what I'm doing but since I've been exposed to the GLOBE program I've, it's really helped me understand how it's not just chemistry, it's not just math, it's not just biology, that really everything's fairly interwoven. Mm -hmm. So what is the suggestion that you might have for K-12 teachers listening to encourage them that just because they teach one subject, um, that GLOBE still might be for them? That's a great question, and I think part of it is really... I'm going to go back to a quote that I saw this morning on the screen from uh, one of the the kids that is, that are involved in the in the program here in California, where she was talking about having boxes in her brain, and that um, she was saying that there was, or actually I think it was a uh, it was from Canada, a student in Canada, where there was a box in her brain for the arts, and there was a box in her brain for science, and there was a box in and realizing, and what GLOBE made her realize, or helped her to realize, was that having those boxes was really of no use. And that you really should, um, and that GLOBE helped her to actually break down those boxes. And I think we all 
get so wrapped up sometimes, whether we're teachers, like I also was a teacher uh, of our own subject area, that it's hard sometimes for us to cut the boundaries or get outside the box maybe and start integrating. But we don't live in a world of boxes. I mean, you look out here in the environment that we're in, I don't see any boxes of walls that are separating the atmosphere from the water that we're sitting over or the, the, the seagulls that are flying by. They're all interactive and interwoven into this one environment mm -hmm. and so there are no boxes and we have to overcome that idea that there are boxes to really look at how we can integrate things and that can sometimes overwhelm people too because mm -hmm. then it's like well where do i stop and, and so i think it's a step-by-step -step process for people to really go at their own pace to try to figure out how do i diminish the box and actually start reaching out into these other areas so that I can start integrating. And GLOBE is a great way for doing that because the chemistry that you look at in the water is impacting not alone the water, but also the atmosphere, right? And also the, the fish that live in the water and the other animals, the macroinvertebrates, we have a protocol for those. And, and you know, in other areas of the world, the mosquitoes that we are studying and so on. So... There are no boxes, and we like to put things in boxes sometimes, but it doesn't help us if we do that. That's a great, thank you very much. That's a very nice clarification. Yeah, I certainly like that. Um, let's go back. You said you were a teacher before. Yep. How did you get to where you are today? Teach, what Love. did you teach? <laughs> like, <laughs> I like that. Okay. <laughs> um, so I actually started off as a teacher in Ireland. Uh, I'm from Ireland originally. I got my undergraduate degree there and my master's degree there. I ended up teaching in an outdoor education center. I always had a great love for the outdoors um, and that was really through my parents, particularly my mom. I came from a large family. There was eight of us and I was the youngest and I remember she would take the younger kids sometimes down. I was also very lucky where I lived. I lived right next to a national park where I grew up. And so, and it butted right up to the town. So it was very easy to walk from the town into the national park. And I remember her taking us down by the river and we'd be fishing for little bods, we used to call them, the little tiny fish in the, in the river, and we'd have the nets, and she would be sitting on the shore, and we'd be in there, you know, playing in the water and stuff, and I was very lucky to live in an environment like that, and uh, live in a natural environment like that, too. And so then when I became a teacher, I really gravitated more towards outdoor education, and so I ended up teaching in an outdoor education setting, and then when I moved to the U.S., I ended up teaching in northern Minnesota for a number of years in an outdoor education center. And um, I went and did my doctoral degree then at Ohio State. And I, was, I had a great um, advisor there. She put me forward for a, a C Grant Fellowship. And part of that C Grant Fellowship was to go to D.C. for a year. There was this brand new program that was starting called GLOBE. <laughs> and she said, you know, you should try for that. You'd be really good working in that program. For this particular fellowship, you basically spent a week in D.C. And you, it, and it's still going, this fellowship. But you would um, interview with agencies that were looking for people for a year. And uh, for interns for a year. And it was amazing. And I ended up uh, with Globe for a year and this was in 1995 when the program was just starting and so the very first teacher's guide I was given the job of getting that teacher's guide ready getting it ready for the first workshops that would begin around Earth Day of 95 and so there was a lot of work that had to be done very very quickly to get that ready but it was an intense experience and then when my year was up they asked if I would like to stay on for another year or so or some more time so i did so i ended up being at the office in dc for two and a half years or almost three years so and it was like one of the best experiences i have ever had when i left then i went to teach in minnesota at a university 
on the deformed frogs. They were finding deformed frogs in Minnesota. I don't know if any of you remember that, but so I ran that project for a while with the state of Minnesota and the university that I was teaching at. And again, it was a citizen science project. These deformed frogs were first found by a group of middle school kids in Henderson, Minnesota, and had highlighted this fact. And so there was some funding put towards it. I still remain in contact with GLOBE because I, I took became a partner with the program back when I moved uh, to Minnesota. Then I moved institutions and I stayed a partner still. And then back in 2012, I was lucky enough to become director of the program. So I've been involved for the whole 25 years, of, or almost 25 years of the program. So. It, the program itself started was a... The U.S. based only. No, at no, that it time? was it, it was international at always, the time. It was always on being international. Large the, international. Yeah, because the the intent was really to get information into a global database so that kids anywhere in the world would be able to access it and access not alone their own local environmental data but also worldwide environmental data. A lot of people might not have been around in '95 that are listening, or they may have been really young. But '95, you know, was there was no internet or very little of it in schools. So the program was partly the impetus for a lot of computers getting into schools. When the program started first, there was also an intent to get internet into the schools so that this program could be part of the offerings that were available to teachers. So um, there were grants for computers, for getting your your school wired and so on associated with the program. It was pretty amazing and to see how quickly countries got on board and how quickly schools got on board and some schools started entering data after they were trained immediately. It was pretty amazing. And it was also amazing to actually see that the agencies were tasked. There were six agencies initially tasked with getting this program together in less than a year. Oh. And they were able to pull it off, which was amazing if you look at government works often yeah <laughs> um and you know four of the six existing agencies are still working together on the program nasa is the primary funder but we yeah. also have the national science foundation the NOAA, um NOAA agency and then also the department of state because it is international now the audience for our podcast is mm-hmm. teachers and, and students right. oftentimes they're li- the students will be listening to it in class sometimes sometimes even assignments right however We've had a lot of scientists themselves tell us that they are also listening to the podcast just to find out what everyone else is doing. And you're saying that this is still this is a database that scientists use also. What would your pitch or I want to say sales pitch, but I don't know what's the right words. I want to kind of want to say what's your sales pitch to a scientist? Why? Would they want to be involved and maybe trust the data? Right. That's because oftentimes if it's not collected sure. by them and they're afraid it's it's maybe not the quality right. and inaccuracy. So what what would you say to a scientist who might be interested in participating in Globe? So I I guess I'd say a couple of things. One is visit the website itself, look at um, the data that are available, which are freely available to anybody. Um, secondly, look at the protocols, the scientific measurements, and how they've been developed. They were developed through NSF uh, proposals and that scientists received to actually develop these protocols so that they could be used with teachers, so that the teachers could actually then get the students to collect the data. There's a lot of uh, technology that has changed over the last 25 years, too. So now we also have an app available that people can enter data. And again, to download the app, uh, I would you know, advise the scientists to download the app and look at what's in there to see how it's done. Also to talk to some of the scientists that are involved in the program. We have a Globe a globe International STEM Network, which is open to scientists to join or any STEM professional to join. But also many of those STEM professionals are the scientists who are using the data. And that if they want to talk particularly to scientists, uh, we at the office can put them put them in touch with those scientists. But we have, for instance, on the NASA side, we have Dr. Lynn Chambers, who is using the cloud data that the students collect. Um, On the um, geography side, well, not so much geography, I guess, but maybe urban heat island effect, we have Dr. Kevin Sikowski from the University of Toledo, who also uses student data 
uh, in his research and gets students to collect data at certain periods of time. We also run campaigns that scientists can get involved with. And if scientists are interested in having campaigns around a specific measurement that we already have, we're happy to work with them to do that. But um, I would encourage them to, first of all, visit the, the site and look at the protocols and then talk with some of the existing members of the Global International STEM Network that we have to actually find out. We do have some publications that scientists have actually um, published that really, uh, as part of their uh, publication, it, 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 uh, it documents, I guess, the uh, uh, issues around quality and accuracy of data as well. And in many cases, the data that these students are collecting is just as accurate as what a graduate student might collect, or uh, in some of, the auto some of the cases where there's automated data coming in of that automated data. Tony, we're coming up on a very special anniversary for Globe, the 25th anniversary. Yep. And you sounds like you've been around from the very beginning. You've, you've seen it begin. Yep. And you're part of the, you're planning, right, for the, for the 25th? Right. So my question is, where do you see Globe in the next 25 years? So we are ready to celebrate our 50th anniversary. <laughs> what is your I'm vision? here with a, with a beard, down to my knees, and, <laughs> and walk the stick. Um, so... Well, I think, you know, we're, we're at 122 countries. There's 200 and something, I think, in the, in the world. So I'm hoping that we're going to get closer to that mark in the next 25 years. I think, think that technology will change a lot of what we do and make it easier for students and teachers to, uh, and citizen scientists to enter data into our system. I think, and I hope that we will finally crack that nut around scientists' perspective on data that have been collected by, by students, teachers, and citizen scientists, and that they will put more trust in that data. Um, and then I think also we will see the fruition of this because many of the students that have gone through the program and are now alums of the program mm -hmm. are becoming STEM professionals. And I think that they will be, they are the future of the world, right? right? And they are going to be the future decision makers and the future scientists. And I'm hoping that they will help us to, you know, address some of the issues that we're going to face environmentally in the next 25 years, in the next five years even. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's going to be a good test, I think, for the program mm -hmm. and also a great advantage and, and opportunity for the program. Perfect. Well, we saved no. the hardest question for last, right? Oh. <laughs> Let's say you're, we're, I know we're at the North American Regional Meeting currently. Right. It's being yep. held right now in uh, the University of California, Berkeley. But let's say you're you finish tomorrow. Right? Tomorrow's our last day of the meeting. You fly home. I don't fly home tomorrow. Oh, you don't fly? Okay. I'm visiting schools on Friday. So. Oh, okay. Visiting schools Friday. Yeah. Okay. Well, Which is really cool to point out that the director of an international program goes to schools yes. to work with kids and help kids right. talk to students himself. That's you don't awesome. uh, yeah. you don't see that every day. Right. That's right. That's well, kudos yeah. to you. Well, thank you. But the kids and the teachers are really the heart of this program. They make yes. it work. The partners, every because this is a community, everybody is part of that heart, I guess. But the beating part is really the students and the teachers because they make the effort yes. to make this work. And without them, we wouldn't have the data. So, you know, we have to really appreciate them and you know i was a teacher so i really yeah. appreciate teachers and i just love seeing the students doing their work well whenever you do get home yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, going to schools. and let's say let's just pretend that then you had the whole next week wide open you had no plans what would you do for fun what would you do to unwind and relax if i could do anything i would probably go for a hike in uh in some of the rockies or outside and because I live in Colorado, uh -huh. so I'll go for a hike in the foothills, or um, because I, I like being outdoors. I don't get outdoors enough anymore, mm -hmm. but I really love being in the outdoors and just whether it's with somebody or on my own, just reflecting and and being in this great on this great place and realizing that you know we are so lucky to live on a planet like this mm -hmm. and to live in an area like this. And that we are, you know, thank our lucky stars every day that we have this ability to be able to be part of this great world. So. Well, thank you for sharing with us. And sure. thank you for being our guest. We really appreciate your time.
And, well, and I'd like to thank the two of you for all the work that you do for Globe 2 and, and all of the other programs that you bring to the attention of teachers and to students. And, you know, you guys also do great work. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you for that. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you love superheroes of science, be sure to subscribe, rate, and give a review on iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Be sure to join us as we add interviews of scientists and incorporate discussions of current trends in K-12 science. Until next time, be super and remember, you are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down. <laughs>